us or ones like them before, but as little as 35 years ago, we couldn't have had this view. It's only since we've been able to conquer gravity and examine our planet from space that such photographs have been possible. The third planet out from the Sun and the fifth largest in the solar system, the Earth is the only planet on which life is known to have evolved. From space we can see clouds and land masses but no sign of life. Nearer still there's more geographical detail but we still can't see that this is a living world. Yet, when we get to the surface, the planet is teeming with life. And it comes in all shapes and sizes, from elephants to birds to ants, and smaller still. Only about 30% of the surface rocks are visible, the remainder being covered by water. The surface consists of a number of plates, composed mainly of silicate rock, floating on the underlying semi-solid mantle. These plates carry the continents and are in constant motion. Where adjacent plates interact, earthquakes occur and volcanoes may be formed. Rivers get pushed off course by earth movements. Lava flows up from beneath the surface of the planet. Despite the fact that the Earth is around 4,600 million years old, it's still an active planet. The presence of an atmosphere around the Earth means that very few meteorites from outer space ever reach the surface. They burn up in the upper atmosphere, but a few do get through from time to time, like the one that came down in China a few years ago. A small one, but it made quite a hole. Nothing like the huge crater made by a giant meteorite in Arizona thousands of years ago. But these craters are rare. Few meteorites get through in the first place, and the erosion of winds and water, freezing and thawing, have obliterated most traces. All these factors have a smoothing effect on the terrain. The energy received from the Sun is critical to the existence of life on Earth. The distance of the Earth from the Sun, about 150 million kilometers, was vital in providing the conditions for life. But just how critical a factor is the distance from the Sun? Perhaps we should examine the Earth's planetary neighbors. Venus, the planet nearest in size to Earth, is only about 110 million kilometers from the Sun. At this distance, water vapour, produced as the planet first cooled, couldn't condense to form oceans. As a result, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere couldn't be removed by dissolving in water and becoming trapped in rocks. So a permanent greenhouse effect was created. Space probes sent by the Americans and Russians have shown the surface temperature to average around 460 degrees Celsius. This is a reconstruction, of course. The probe's radar has been able to penetrate the murk of Venus to reveal a rocky landscape devoid of life. The hellish red colouring of these photographs is caused by the radar photography. If Venus is too hot, what about the Earth's other neighbour, Mars, the red planet? Mars lies about 230 million kilometres from the Sun and has a diameter just over half that of Earth. At this distance from the Sun, heat isn't a problem and the surface temperature ranges from a comfortable 26 degrees Celsius maximum at the equator to a chilly minus 80 degrees Celsius at the poles. Probes have been sent to Mars too, reporting back on the planet's atmosphere and surface features. A soft landing probe has sent back photographs of the Martian scene. No liquid water exists on the planet because the planet's lower gravity 
means that its atmospheric pressure is too low. As with Venus, the atmosphere consists mainly of carbon dioxide and predictably the probes have detected no signs of life on Mars. It's almost certain that in the infancy of the Earth too, our own planet's atmosphere was also composed mainly of carbon dioxide. On Earth, the gas dissolved in the oceans and became trapped as carbonate compounds in the rocks. You can do an experiment in school to show how water with minerals dissolved in it, lime water in this case, can trap the carbon dioxide you breathe out. The water turns cloudy as the carbon dioxide reacts with the minerals to form insoluble carbonate compounds. Scientists think that much of the carbon dioxide in the Earth's original atmosphere was absorbed by single-celled organisms and then deposited to form rocks. Experiments have been carried out on a primitive atmosphere containing the gases thought to be present on Earth around 4,000 million years ago. Passing an electric spark through the mixture of gases to simulate lightning produces compounds similar to those on which all living things are based. Life, in the form of the first cells, is believed to have started in the Precambrian period, well over 3,000 million years ago. The compounds produced in the primitive atmosphere could have formed simple organisms capable of carrying out photosynthesis using energy from the sun and the carbon dioxide which was still plentiful in the atmosphere. They'd have been able to reproduce themselves and start the evolution of life on Earth. These first living organisms produced oxygen while the carbon dioxide was being reduced. The oxygen could have poisoned other organisms, but this was the time when the first great division of living things occurred, a division that continues to the present day, between the plants that produced oxygen and the animals, like fish, that could breathe oxygen. If the distance of the Earth from the Sun is so important for the evolution of life, Perhaps we should look next at the body nearest to us, the moon. The largest and brightest of all objects in the night sky, the moon has been an object of fascination throughout human history. The bright part of its surface reflects light mainly from the sun, whilst the tiny part of the light is reflected from the earth. This is sometimes noticeable when there's a crescent moon. However little we see of the moon lit by the sun, it's always the same part of the moon's surface. This is because the moon's period of rotation is exactly the same as its period of revolution around the Earth. The same side of the moon always faces us. The surface is made up of three main features. Bright craters and mountains and darker seas called maria. The craters have been formed by two different processes, volcanic activity and meteorite impact. The moon appears to have been formed about the same time as the Earth, around 4,600 million years ago. It's not known whether it was a separate body captured by the Earth's gravitational field, or if it was formed when another planetary body crashed into the Earth. Early in its history, the moon underwent a heavy bombardment of meteorites, some of which seem to have been very large. This is a reconstruction of one of those impacts. These broke through the surface crust, producing huge basins. Subsequently, volcanic lava from the interior poured out to form the darker maria. All the features on the moon's surface remain sharp and easily visible from the Earth because there's no water or atmosphere to erode them. But how do we know so much about the moon? 
A great deal of our knowledge is as a result of careful observations by astronomers over the centuries. Telescopes have been developed to the point where they can give us very good photographs of the moon. But once spaceflight became a reality, the moon became the target of a number of scientific unmanned spacecraft. Some of these crashed into the moon, but others were designed to land and send back information about conditions on the surface. Another series flew over the surface, photographing the landscape and relaying the pictures back to Earth. Again, this is a reconstruction. The first pictures of the far side of the moon, the side we'd never seen before, came from the Soviet spacecraft Luna 3 in 1959, radioed back to Earth. Ranger 6 became the first successful lunar lander in 1964, and at least 16 other craft reached the moon's surface in the next five years. We were learning a great deal more about the moon in those years of unmanned flights. For example, robot arms on some of the moon landers sampled the lunar surface. In 1969, however, scientists had a much more important chance to gather information and data from the moon's surface. Using the giant Saturn rocket, a manned mission could now be sent to the moon. The triumph of years of engineering and technological development. People had been dreaming about a voyage to the moon for centuries. Only the technology of the 20th century could achieve it. Computers were vital to the project plotting the course from the rocket's takeoff to timing the separation of all the component parts of the spaceship. Only the small forward part of the whole massive construction would reach the moon. Sections of the launch rocket were jettisoned in space after they'd done their work of lifting the spaceship off the Earth and on its way to the Moon. America's Apollo 11 mission landed Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin on the Moon's surface on the 20th of July, 1969. Right, coming up nine We're now in the approach phase, everything looking good. Altitude 4200. Houston, you're a go for landing, over. 40 feet down, two and a half. Picking up some dust. 30 feet, two and a half down. Great shadow. Four forward. Four forward, drift into the right a little. 30, down and a half. 30 seconds. Forward, just. Good. Ready? Contact light. Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. They collected samples of rocks and soil and set up scientific experiments, including a seismometer, before returning to Earth. They'd spent almost a day on the Moon's surface. Armstrong and Aldrin returned safely to Earth, and the success of Apollo 11 was followed four months later with a second mission. Apollo 12 was to land on a different part of the Moon's surface and explore more widely. More samples of Moon rock were collected and brought back to Earth for analysis. Further missions to different parts of the Moon followed. Twelve astronauts spent a total of 160 man-hours on the Moon's surface and brought back more than 400 kilograms of samples of rocks and soil. So far, we've concentrated our attention on Earth's nearest neighbours. But what about the other planets in the solar system? Mercury, the other inner planet, is also one of the smallest. 
never more than 70 million kilometers from the Sun and extremely hot. It appears to be very similar to our moon. Beyond the inner family of the four rocky planets are four much larger planets made up largely of gas. Of these, the giant planets Jupiter and Saturn are the most impressive. Jupiter is the largest planet in the solar system. It has a volume more than 1,300 times that of the Earth and is 300 times the mass of our home planet. Like the Sun, Jupiter is made up almost entirely of hydrogen and helium, together with some ammonia. Its surface also shows a feature called the Great Red Spot, a vast storm which seems to have lasted for more than 300 years. At the time the solar system was formed, Jupiter was almost large enough to have formed a small star and has its own family of at least 16 moons. Io has active volcanoes and there's Europa and Ganymede, the largest of Jupiter's moons, appears to be a mixture of ice and rock. Callisto is probably the oldest of the moons. Saturn is almost as large as Jupiter and similar in composition. It's even more spectacular with its system of rings. These were originally thought to be unique, but the Voyager spacecraft showed that both Jupiter and Uranus have smaller ring systems. As well as the spectacular rings, Saturn also has a family of more than 20 moons. These range in size from the barely visible, a few tens of kilometers in diameter, to Titan, with a diameter of 5,000 kilometers. That's larger than Mercury. In a NASA reconstruction, we can journey on from Saturn to Uranus. Uranus is thought to be similar in composition to Jupiter and Saturn, but much further from the Sun. As well as its rings, it also has a large number of moons. The last two planets of the solar system make a strange pair. Neptune has a rather higher density than Uranus and only two moons. The larger of these, Triton, is twice the size of our own moon. The final planet of the Sun's family is something of a curiosity. Pluto wasn't identified until 1930 and is smaller than all the other planets. Unlike the other outer planets, it seems to be rocky and moves in an elliptical, tilted orbit which brings it back inside the orbit of Neptune from time to time. It's been suggested that it may be a former moon of Neptune or a captured asteroid rather than a true planet. All the same, this furthest planet from the Sun does have a moon of its own. Although we've landed on our own moon, and sent many unmanned spacecraft to different parts of the solar system as far as distant Pluto and beyond. We're only just beginning to discover our surroundings in space. It's rather like knowing the inside of our home very well and knowing the garden and the rest of the street just by looking through the window. Who knows what we might find once we start to explore beyond what we can see. Guide is